Well, good morning, church. Man, thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, someone just said welcome back. And for those of you that have never been here before, you're like, what in the world is going on in this place right now? Uh, but, but the reason why I'm being welcomed back is, 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 is because I am back from being on a month-long sabbatical. Um, and it was amazing. And I, I know I've, yeah, yeah, I guess you can clap for that. Yeah. Um, I, I know I've told many of you this individually, uh, but I just want to say publicly and corporately in front of all of you, my family loves this church. And, and I, yeah, yeah, sorry, I got emotional. I wasn't planning on being emotional. But man, it, even as I was away and enjoying time with family, I think we have some pictures of us. We had a great time on sabbatical. We just goofed off. We went and did some things, but honestly, we did some stupid stuff. Like we went and ate at Waffle House. My kids had never been there. Um, so that, that, you know, that's tradition. I took it to my favorite taqueria. You know, we did all kinds of goofy stuff. Uh, but something that my wife and I talked about while I was on sabbatical, and again, I did, whenever I wrote this, I wasn't emotional, but I am right now. Something that we talked about when I was on sabbatical is my dream for my life is to spend the rest of my life in this place. I, I, I love you, church, and I, I'm so grateful that I get the opportunity to open God's word with you every single week, week in and week out, and get to teach from this pulpit. My kids love you, but I also want to say publicly, thank you for valuing family. Thank you for for giving us the opportunity to get away. The time with my kids and my wife was just invaluable. And so I just just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that said, I want to ask you to open uh, with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. If this is your first week with us or your first week in a while, uh, we, we just started a series last week called Words to Live By. Words to Live By. And what I was tasked with before my sabbatical and upon return was that I was supposed to today teach on my life verse. That's what I'm supposed to preach on. And as I began to pray about this, and and this might trouble some of you as congregants, I started thinking about it, I don't have a life verse yet. (laughs) It just hasn't happened for me. I don't know. I'm praying about it. You know, God, what is? But there, there are several different passages of Scripture that God has used to influence me, to convict me, to inspire me, to encourage me, to lead me, uh, even to rebuke me. Uh, but, but I don't have one verse. I'm like, you know what? That's, that's my life verse. Uh, and so because of that, we're just going to go ahead and call it a day. Y'all can go home. Just kidding. Not really. Um, but but as, as I was praying about this, uh, uh, the scripture that just kept kind of coming back on my heart over and over and over again isn't necessarily my life verse, but it's maybe my favorite Jesus story in all of the Gospels in Matthew chapter 14. And it's my favorite Jesus story in all of the Gospels for a couple reasons. One of them is it's not like sanitized. You know what I mean? Like, like we see all of the emotions and all the feelings and everything the disciples are walking through in this story. And you're going to see what I'm talking about in a second. We see, we see highs and we see lows in this story. But also, I love this story because I believe it reveals to us an aspect of Christianity that, 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 that all too often is lost in the West. And that is that when Jesus Christ calls us to follow him, Jesus isn't just focused about what happens after we die, but Jesus is also calling us to a life of adventure while we live. And, and, and I think sadly, all, all too often, those of us that are Christians, we miss out on the adventurous life of Christ because we have bought the enemy's twist on truths that all God cares about is eternity. For example, I, I, think, I think for many of us, we, we take some truths. I, I want to read you some truths that I wrote this week that are very, very, very true. Truths like this. That because of our sin, we're separated from God for eternity. Jesus made a way for us to be united with God in eternity. If you believe in Jesus, you can go to heaven. If you don't believe in Jesus, you will go to hell. We take those statements, and please hear me, all those are truthful statements. I affirm the validity and the theologic astuteness and and how how biblical every single one of those statements are. But can I just remind you that our enemy is the prince of twisting truths to confuse believers 
and to believing lies. And I believe what can happen is that we can be so focused on eternity that we forget about the promises that we have from Jesus right now. Christian, that you can be free from sin right now. That God has a purpose and a plan for your life right now. That you have the ability to follow the Holy Spirit of God every single moment of your life starting right now. Not not 80 years from now. Right now. And, And I'll testify to you that the greatest and most thrilling adventures of my life have come from times in my life when I was willing to follow Jesus right now, even when I didn't know the outcome. So here's, here's my prayer. I just want to make it known to you. If you want to know, man, what, what's, this, what's this bald bearded guy's goal today? What's he trying to do? You know, what's he trying to pull? I'm going to tell you. My, my goal today, my prayer today, is that today, we could awaken to the adventure that Jesus has called us to. That that in this room, the hundreds of followers of Jesus in here and online that have been lulled in the apathy could embrace adventurously following Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you have them open to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, where, we, where we're going to be today is about halfway through Jesus' gospel ministry, Jesus' earthly ministry. So, so up until this point, if you're unfamiliar with Matthew, where we are in Matthew's gospels is, is Jesus has picked 12 guys to follow him. They, the, the Bible word for these followers were Jesus' disciples. They were kind of like his protégés. They were the people that were following him the closest. Now, Jesus was on his way to the cross, and, and, and we can see that uh, looking back, right? Hindsight's twenty twenty. These guys had no idea that Jesus was headed to a cross. They were just following this new religious leader that was doing amazing things. And Jesus was actually using, for those of you that are in business or you manage people and you've heard the acronym MAL, right? Model, assist, watch, leave. Not, not mauling someone, okay? But model, assist, watch, leave. If you've been management, you've heard that. Jesus actually models that for one of the very first times in the first century because as he's walking with the disciples, you can trace through this in, in the book of Matthew. You see Jesus first in Matthew kind of five through nine. You see Jesus modeling for the disciples what they're supposed to do through his teaching and through his living. Uh, and then after that, in Matthew 10 through 20, 25, Jesus both assists them and then watches them do what he's called them to do, and then Jesus leaves. And so, so what's so amazing is in Matthew chapter 10, right before we're going to pick up today, Jesus has actually sent the disciples out for the very first time, and he entrusts his ministry to his disciples. Some of them were teenagers. Some of you don't even trust your teenagers to feed your dogs, Right? But Jesus, Jesus trusted his entire ministry to some teenagers, and he sent them out, and they were amazed at what they got to see God do. And they come back, and, and we see uh, in, the, in the earlier part in, in Matthew 14, we see, we see Jesus brings them together. And, and at first, he tries to get them away. And they're going to retreat, kind of like a spiritual retreat, and kind of evaluate everything that they were able to process in doing. And so he takes them away. But, but Scripture tells us, go and read Matthew 10 all the way through the first part of chapter 14. What you'll see is that a crowd of people finds them. And so Jesus sits them down, and it, it, it says in the text that there are 5,000 men. Lots of theologians think that there's women and children there. So there's in between ten and 15,000 people on this hillside hearing Jesus speak. And Jesus speaks, and then Jesus turns to the disciples, who again are on this like youth camp revival high. They're super stoked. They just got back. They've seen God do amazing things. And Jesus turns to them, and he's like, hey, I feel really burdened for these people. Why don't you feed them? And remember, this is like time before fast food, right? Nothing is fast about food in the first century. Now, I want you to imagine with me today, if if today I decided right now, Tommy, I think at the end of today, I think think after the second service, I think we should feed every single person that comes on our campus. You know, a thousand people, something like that. I hear amens in the room, you know? That would be a massive undertaking. 
It would be so, so, so difficult. I mean, after all, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday, right? Like, what are we going to do? I don't know. You know, but, but we live in an age of fast food where we could go to McDonald's and Taco Bell and all those other places that serve things that may be food we don't know, you know, and, and we could gather food and, and we could maybe make that happen, but, but this is way before that. And the disciples are like, man, what do you, what do you mean, Jesus? We can't do that. And they, 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 they panic. And they panic, don't miss this. And I promise this is important for where we're headed. They panic because they're looking to themselves to supply what Jesus has called them to. Have you ever been there? Where, where Jesus has called you to do something and it, it just freaks you out because you're looking to yourself to be able to accomplish what Christ has called you to and really, Jesus never called us to self-sufficiency. He called us to himself because he is all sufficient. So they make it through it. Jesus feeds the masses of people. And, and it turns out, if you read John's account of the story, at the very end of this, uh, the crowd wanted to make Jesus king after this. You know the whole phrase, feed a man a fish? You know, you feed him for a day, feed 5,000 men fish, they'll make you a king, right? That, that's what's going on here. And so Jesus, knowing what's happening, he, he actually sends the disciples away on a boat while he dismisses the crowds. And that's where I want to pick up here in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. In verse 22, it says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. What's so interesting about this, just a quick point, Jesus never sought accolades or a platform of any sort. Isn't that intriguing? In the 21st century American church where oftentimes we seek a platform, if we can't get one, we make one up on social media, right? Jesus not only rejects a platform, he sends it away. Christians, this should, this should remind us that we need to check ourselves check ourselves. But, but not only that, the story continues, and it tells us that after Jesus gets everybody in the boat, sends them away, sends the crowd home, hey, keep your crown. I'm not, you're not going to crown me king yet. You know, little they know, he's already king. You know, but, but, but anyway, sends them away. And then, Scripture tells us, that, that he goes up on a mountainside to pray. Now, I wonder if you've ever thought about the concept of Jesus praying ever thought about that? It's kind of an interesting thing to think about because we believe in a trinity that is God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus goes up to pray, who's he praying to? <laughs> Himself? It made me think this last week, why, why does Jesus pray? Why does he do that? Why does Jesus choose to pray here? You know, it, 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 if, if I were thinking about this, I, I was thinking, you know, if, if Jesus is praying to himself and, and praying about himself, it's almost like talking to yourself and speaking in the third person at the exact same time, right? Like, Jeremy, I really feel like I need a taco. Could you help me? Jeremy, could you help me get a taco? Oh, yeah, Jeremy, I see that, Jeremy, you and I want a taco. Do you see how that plays out, Right? If you saw me doing that, you think I was a couple taco shorts of the full Mexican platter, right? Like, what is going on here? Why, why does Jesus pray? I, th I think Jesus prays for a couple reasons. One is that even though we, we don't believe that Jesus lays down his deity fully, we know from Scripture that Jesus did take on an aspect of humanity. We believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man, and in so doing, in some ways, he struggled like us. How do I know that? Hebrews 4, uh, 15 through 16 says this. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. 
See, Jesus is kind of like us in that he struggled with sin. Jesus is different than us in that Jesus never gave in to sin. You know one thing that I know about you today, even though I don't know you, and this might offend you a little bit, I know that you've given in to sin before. I know you have. You know how I know that? Because I have too. None of us are perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. And we see that in this text. But I believe this, that Jesus prayed because he was modeling for us what to do when we're either struggling or faced with making decisions. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You go to the one that does know what to do. What do you do when it feels like the world is falling down around you and you don't know which way to turn? You don't know which way is up? You turn to the one that created the world. If you look at it in the gospel accounts, what's interesting is all four gospel accounts have accounts of Jesus praying. And what is even more interesting is that before every single um, pivotal moment in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus prays and even spends a night praying. The night before Jesus selected all 12 of his disciples, do you know what Jesus spent the night doing? Praying, calling out to God. The night before Jesus went to the cross to die in our place for our sins. Do you know what we have record of Jesus doing in John chapters 15 through 17? We have record of Jesus praying. God, help me. God, I'll do this, but if there's any other way. God, would you, would you be with my followers? Because I'm not going to be with them in the flesh anymore. Would you, would, you, would you help sustain them, God? Christian. If you're looking to see God move in your everyday life, I just want to ask, are you spending time listening for his voice? But but church, church, if we really want to see a movement of God in the greater Baytown area, in Baytown, in Mont Bellevue, in Crosby, in in all of our surrounding areas, do you want to see God move in the schools of of your children? Do you know how that's going to happen? It's not just going to happen through government legislation. It's going to happen through the people of God getting on their knees and praying to a God that can move and does move. Praying to a God that can change things. But as we continue on in the text, we see more details about the story. It says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 25, or 24. It says, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. (laughs) And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. Now, a couple details. First, isn't it amazing how we can just read that someone walked on the sea and just read that like, oh yeah, yeah, he walked on the sea. <laughs> That's crazy, right? The only the person that we have video evidence of doing that is David Blaine, and it's fake, okay? But, but this, this is crazy. I've never seen anybody walk on water, but the text is telling us that. It says that, that, that Jesus, it says that it's the fourth watch of the night, so sometime in between 3 and 6 a.m. So the time that we all hope to be asleep, but for those of us that with little children oftentimes aren't asleep. You know what I'm talking about? The dark of the night. The text further tells us how far Jesus is from land. If you look in your Bibles, even your digital Bibles, even if you have your Bible on your phone or your iPad or something like that, all of your Bibles will have a footnote that takes you down to the bottom of the page and it'll tell you that he was several stadia away from land. If you do a little bit more research in that, most scholars think that Jesus was at least 400 but likely 600 plus yards away from the land. For those of us that grew up in Texas, That's more than six football fields away from land. Jesus is away from the land. And not only is is he a ways away from land, there's a storm that's blowing in. And it tells us the wind is whipping the waves. So, So, I mean, 600 yards is a long way to swim. I've never swam 600 yards. Maybe some of you athletes in the room have. You know, I've never done that. But not only is it a tough distance to swim, it would be a hard distance to row, too, because you'd be rowing against the waves. And so Jesus, in his divine logic, decides to lift up his robe and start walking on water to them. It's kind of an amazing 
thing, supernatural twist to imagine. What's incredible is, is up to this point, in Matthew chapter 8, we've seen that Jesus, he has power over the water, because in Matthew 8, he's stilled the water, but we've never seen him walk on it. This story reminds us of the theological fact that all natural laws bend to the sovereignty of Jesus. Jesus is sovereign over all things. This is also the point in theology that we can point to and answer why can Christians face a diagnosis that's dire? Why can Christians dance in the middle of a hurricane? Because we believe that Jesus is sovereign over anything the world or the devil can throw at us. Maybe my favorite psalm, I actually almost preached over this instead of what I'm preaching over today, but it's Psalm 46. I want to read it for you because I think this is talking about God and Jesus. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, We will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You want to know how you can be and live life unfazed when you face the complexities that we face in our life? You make Jesus your refuge. Your bank account isn't big enough to be your refuge. Your life insurance policy isn't large enough to be your refuge. There is not a name of a person that can assume the White House that is strong enough to be your refuge. Only Jesus is strong enough to be your refuge. This is why the nations can rage and we can stand and say, I know my God is in control. This is why the waters can rise and we can say, you know what? This is scary, but I know a God that parts the waters so I can walk on dry land. It's going to be okay. Be still and know. But we forget that. We forget that God is able. And so so are the disciples. Matthew chapter 14, I love this. This is one of my favorite stories in Scripture. These, These couple of verses. Chapter 26, it says, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. That's funny. Can you imagine grown men or at least teenage guys sitting in a boat screaming for their lives because they think they're seeing a ghost. Part of me thinks that the only reason that Jesus chose to walk on the water was to prank the disciples. Because I think we serve a God of great humor. Verse 27, but immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, I know it's easy to make fun of the disciples, but man, put yourself in their sandals for a minute, right? Think about it. If, if you were in a boat and you were in a storm, it's 3 a.m., and you've been rowing for who knows how long, unless they were just being lazy and cutting up in the boat before the storm hit, they had likely been rowing for hours against a storm. They had likely been, been just laboring. And then I'm just imagining, because Peter's the loud mouth of the group, like I'm just imagining someone speaks up and is like, 
Wait a second. I see something, y'all. Like, pick up the oar, dadgummit. We're trying to make way. Oh, I see something. What would you think it was? The Loch Ness Monster? A merman? I don't know. They think it's a, it's a ghost. But Jesus calls out to them. and says, take heart. If you're in a storm today, I think Jesus would call out to you as well. Say, take heart. Take heart. Matthew 14, 28 says, and, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, Peter is known for saying some pretty crazy things. I think this is maybe one of the more crazy ones recorded in all of Scripture. Right? Out of all the tests that you could give Jesus in this moment. Like, Jesus, if it's you, what did I get you for your birthday last year? Jesus, if it's you, what did we eat for dinner tonight? But no. <laughs> Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, call me to come to you on the water. I want to read the entirety of the rest of the scripture. Verse 29. He said, Jesus said, come. Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And it says, and when they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. What an incredible scene, right? This is just a warning. Be careful what you ask Jesus to do for you, because he just might do it. <laughs> But I, uh, Peter asks Jesus to call him out on the water. Now, I, I, was, I was imagining this scene this last week, and I'm just imagining Peter in a boat, and likely the boat was a little bit bigger than a 14-foot John boat, but we're in Texas, right? This is what we like to put around in, especially on the Gulf. But I'm, I'm imagining Peter is sitting in a boat, buffeted by the waves. And G, he calls out, first he sees what he thinks is a ghost, and then he identifies, I, nope, it's Jesus. It, maybe it's a Jesus ghost, but it's at least a Jesus ghost, right? And he calls out to Jesus and says, Jesus, if it's you, call me out. Now, I don't know how tall the boat was. Chances are it was probably a little bit taller than the 18 inches of this John boat right here. But, but Peter had to do a lot to get out of the boat. I mean, just imagine a man in a robe climbing out of a wooden boat. It's kind of a crazy thing to think about. But as I was thinking, and, and some of us, for later in the story, we give, we give Peter a hard time about sinking. But I just want you to think about what it took for Peter to get out of the boat. Just that one step from here to there. It's a big step. I think for lots of us Christians, if you are honest with yourself today, I think lots of us, where we find ourselves spiritually, is right here, in the boat. Why? Because I know the boat, right? The boat is good. The boat is dry. The boat is warm. The boat is comfortable. If the boat ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I know the boat. And I just, I just wonder today, Christian in the room, are you still in the boat today? Are you still in the boat? And if you are, what would it take to get you out of the boat to follow Jesus wherever he's calling you? 
I think for some of us, what, what keeps us from getting out of the boat is that we say, man, God, if you'll just tell me like the next three steps, like I'll get out of the boat if I know step two, I'm not sinking down in the wave. But will you just let me know, like will you open up the spiritual Holy Spirit crystal ball and let me see sort of three steps from here? And we forget that Psalm 119 says that his word is a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. It doesn't say it's a spotlight that shows us 80 yards from here. It's that next step. For some of us, we've been sitting here so long and Jesus is calling out to us and we are just doing this right here. I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, you, you can't be talking to me. All right, don't you see that I'm in a boat? This is a nice boat. Don't you see that I'm here? Christian today, what will it take you to get out? To take the first step out. Can you imagine what that was like for both Peter and the disciples? That first step on the water. Like, Peter, you loudmouth, you're not going to do it. Oh my gosh, he's doing it. <laughs> and he, he takes his first step. And then another step, I'm just picturing like, you know, Jim Carrey and Bruce Almighty, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of easing his way on. Imagine the testimony that was not just for Peter, but for everyone else in the boat. What message was that for everyone else that didn't have the faith to get out? But it tells us that, that Peter starts walking toward Jesus, and everything's good, and he's walking maybe even on waves. It's, it's amazing to think about, but, but he's walking on the water, but then somewhere in between where he was and where Jesus was, Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and starts looking around at his circumstances, and what does he do? Starts to sink. Starts to sink, Right? He takes his eyes off Jesus and he starts thinking about himself and he recognizes the truth that he doesn't have the ability to walk on water. Did you know that? Peter did not have a natural gifting of water walking. In fact, if you think you have that spiritual gifting, can I just warn you to start off in the shallow end? Okay? Don't start off because you probably don't either. But Jesus takes his eye, or Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, and he starts sinking. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything like that, but, but I think if we're honest, I think a good many of us in here can really identify with Peter sinking. Like, if you're honest with yourself, Maybe at one point in your life, at some time, you got out of the boat. Maybe 10 years ago, five months ago, last week. You got out of the boat, but, and it was great. It was amazing. You experienced this amazing faith thing. But then, then life came. And, and you started sinking. I just want to ask you today, do you feel like you're sinking today? And if that's you, I want to point you to the text. What, do, what does Peter do when he's sinking? He doesn't start swimming. <laughs> he calls out to Jesus. He calls out to Jesus. And what I love about this text is in verse 30, it says, immediately Jesus grabbed him pulled him to himself immediately there's someone in the room right now that needs to hear if you will turn to jesus this morning jesus will immediately find you where you are he will immediately find you where you are i want to i want to end uh this sermon where matthew ends this story the last couple of verses in verse 31 it says jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That seems like a harsh rebuke. The dude did just walk on water. 
Is like, do you think that Jesus is asking a real question? Like Jesus is actually curious, like, hey, why did you doubt? What was it that made you doubt? I'm Peter, I'm like, well, I can think of three things. The wind, the waves, and the whole defying gravity thing. That's what made me doubt. I think Jesus is, in a way, rebuking Peter, but I think also Jesus is asking a hypothetical question. If you see the way that this is phrased, he's saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It's almost like Jesus is saying, did you see what you can do with just a little bit of faith in me? Why did you doubt what I'm capable of, Peter? Why did you doubt that? Why did you take your eyes off me, Peter? What I want to call you to today, church, is to turn your eyes to Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus, wherever you are. If you're still in the boat and you're afraid to get out, God's called you to something and you're just like, man, I just don't know. God's called you to start a small group and it just, it makes you so nervous. And you're just like, I just don't know. God's called you to start a ministry and you just don't know how that's going to work. You don't know the details of how it's going to play out. God's called you to have a conversation with someone. It's difficult. It's hard. Yeah, I just don't know how this is going to go. Just turn your eyes to Jesus. Just follow him. If you feel like you're sinking today, maybe you feel like you're sinking in sin. You thought you were right next to Jesus, but you're realizing you're neck deep right now. And you don't know your way out. Would you turn your eyes to Jesus? Like the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord Jesus, would you help us? God, we don't want to be a gathering of Christians that miss out on the adventure that you've placed before us. Jesus, we need help to place our faith in you. God, we want to admit that we are a people of little faith, but God, would you take the little faith that we have and do much with it? Would you turn our eyes toward you today? We pray that in Jesus' name. Everyone said... Would you stand and sing with us?